thank you for uh, having me here. The bad news is I'm not Anna Flores. Uh, she's not here. She's my PhD student. The good news is I'm giving the talk. <coughs> so I will be presenting work in progress, doing that in two stages. Uh, some theoretical thoughts, which I can keep short, and some data, most of which are quite new. So here we go. We've already heard quite a few things about the current worldview and the fact that it's actually predicated on some uh, presuppositions which Collingwood, who was actually the source for Thomas Kuhn, just uh, as an aside, called absolute presuppositions. Meaning they determine what we think about and how we look at the world and most of them uh, are looking at things in terms of local causes like mechanical causes, like what we just heard, lock and key principle, which means we are looking at things only in ways that we can analyze it causally. <clears throat> also, uh, we go for analysis before synthesis, and mostly we go for matter before consciousness, which is something problematic, I find, and also individuals or particulars before wholes. So what I'm presenting to you is what I would call relative individuality or relative authenticity, because I'm going to speak about more like wholes that develop into individuals and out of individuals into holes again. So <clears throat> I was always a little bit frustrated with that because I think when you look at the experience from parapsychology or complementary medicine, what I've been doing uh, most of my career, you see that you implicitly have to have another paradigm, which is more holistic, which uh, is not causal in the strict sense, but maybe correlationally causal, formal causality in the, in the, in the sense of Aristotle. And uh, maybe more internal relations in, instead of external relations. We heard about those uh, meaning fields. That is something uh, which in philosophical terms is more internal relations. Leibniz had a model like that. And that has been lost along the way of the history of philosophy, and I think we should turn back to that. That is, therefore, we were looking into uh, developing a new paradigm. And I did that a while ago together with physics colleagues from Freiburg, and we published that as generalized quantum theory. Or <clears throat> as a model that is generalizing quantum theory into a systemic area, as it were. So it's not physics. It's using a physical theory to understand systems. Uh, it is the formal theoretical framework of algebraic quantum theory, uh, which is basically in its core designed to deal with incompatible operations. That is the core. Everything else is physical uh, addition, which you need to calculate and that sort of thing. We leave that out and look at the core and we discover, if you do that, the model predicts non-local correlations. Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen like correlations, but not physical ones, but systemic ones. Uh, and meaning that is in all types of systems. No matter what they are made of. They may be made out of chocolate. But if they are in, a, in, in, the, in, in the right frame, you would see such correlations. And that is what it would look like. So if you, if you think about a system, that comprises some elements, and you have descriptions that are incompatible between the whole of the system and the individuals, the model would predict non-local correlations between these elements. And the very basic idea is we always have holes, uh, connectedness, let's say, and we have individuals or, or separateness. Those are the most abstract uh, concepts you can conceive of. And connectedness and separateness are concepts that are, that are incompatible. And if you have them united in one system, then the prediction is there would be non-local correlations. That's the basic theoretical framework from which we start. Now, the idea is, or the, or the problem is, can you actually test that? And the problem is, correlations of that quantum type, uh, they cannot be used for, uh, <clears throat> for signal transmission. That is why we have uh, introduced a theorem in our model, which we call the no-signal-transfer theorem. 
And it actually states you cannot use those uh, correlations to transmit causal signals. You can use them, but not causal signals. Because if you do that, you see that there's uh, different types of things that Bill has seen. You have mice that are healed, although they are not the target of the healing. Or you have the wrong mice healed while the other ones are not healed. That type of thing. And that's relevant for all replication. Now, in quantum theory proper, entanglement correlations are not tested by experiments. They are tested by observations uh, whose result you test against the theoretical prediction. In parapsychology and in healing and all other things, we don't have that theoretical prediction. We have to construct experiments. And that is actually a way of uh, coding signal. So we used a new experiment. Uh, we call it the matrix experiment that was developed by Walter von Lukadu many years ago. And we hope that this does not uh, make signal coding possible. So there were a couple of uh, positive replications previously, so we used that. We newly designed the experiment. We newly rep uh, constructed all the hardware uh, and new protocol. And the principal setup is that of a micro PK experiment. A micro PK experiment where you have a Sinner diode driving a uh, display and someone sitting in front of it instructed to um, intentionally, intentionally influence the display. Uh, the important thing about that experiment, according to Walter von Lukadu, is that the random events are sampled via a uh, Markov chain and not a normal XORing, because that gives the um, appearance of the system a more natural appearance. It's a slower process of development. And this is the display which we use, a simple fractal. And here you see, for instance, that little thing here which would instruct uh, the participant to keep it stable. So this would grow out, of, out or it would shrink and the experimental instruction would be keep it stable or point to the left, shrink it or to the right, grow it. Those were the conditions. And the, standard dif uh, the difference to standard experiment is we are not targeting the random deviation directly. That's the big difference. But we extract variables, actually five physical ones and five uh, psychological ones. We have three runs per instruction. Deviate le uh, right, left, keep centered, and re repeat that. So we have nine runs forming a matrix of nine times five physical and nine times psychological variables, which sets up a huge matrix of 45 physical and 45 psychological variables, which gives us a, pot a potential matrix of potentially 2,025 correlations, okay? That's the difference to a standard PK experiment. We are not targeting the um, deviation from randomness. We are targeting the correlation matrix between those variables. And these are the variables, so they're actually quite simple. We use the, the, this deviation from randomness as one variable, but then we also have the maximum deviation, a deviation of the process from the Markov chain behavior, and then the average voltage and the variance of the voltage at the rec output number seven in that case. We had seven outputs. And as psychological variables, we use the number of key presses because the, the participant has to progress the experiment by pressing shift keys. And he or she can use either left shift, a right shift key, left shift key, or both. When both are pressed, the experiment progresses, and every uh, press of the shift key progresses the experiment. So this is also a measure of the speed of the experiment, okay? And so we have the number of these key presses and the average time between the key presses and the variance, the steadiness of the experiment. Those are the psychological uh, variables which we use. And <clears throat> then we target the number of significant correlations between those variables. We set the significance level at uh, 0.01. This is purely arbitrary. We could use any level, but uh, the previous experiments had done that. Uh, and we use the other significance levels for uh, sensitivity, sen sensitivity analysis. So there are two types of controls. One is chance expectation, because if you run so many correlations, you will expect correlations by chance, right? So this is one uh, control. And then we have control experiment where after each real experiment, we have an empty run by the system. Nobody is sitting in front of it. It's just started, and the operator goes away. And we use the previous uh, psychological variables and match it with that, all right? And then we have a couple of other safeguards uh, just to make the experiment work well. So this is a summary of what the experiment looks like. You have a participant sitting before the rig. You have that displayed uh, with the instructions. 
and then you have these uh, variables. The experimenter press, uh, presses the key, uh, the participant presses the uh, shift keys, and that progresses the uh, experiment, yields the psychological variables, and then we get the correlations. The first study, which was done by Magella Horan, myself, and uh, Walter von Lukadu, was uh, an experiment with 503 single experiments contributed by 243 participants, mostly conferences and uh, seminars and stuff like that. And then we have two replication studies, and these are Anna's data. They are very fresh, and they are only partially evaluated so far uh, in Edinburgh with friends and colleagues. The statistical evaluation is still a matter of debate. We used originally the old evaluation, which was constructed by Walter von Lukadu after input from a referee. And this is actually a standard, uh, standard uh, statistics where you have the deviation between those number of significant correlations uh, in the experimental condition minus the, uh, in the control condition, standardized. And should theoretically, theoretically give you a set score, but only if you have independent uh, data, and that we don't have. That's the problem. Uh, so we are trying to solve that problem by a new evaluation, which we cooked up after a consensus conference uh, last uh, October in Capri, uh, where we said we would probably have to use a, a Monte Carlo analysis with 10,000 randomly uh, uh, populated matrices and find our own distribu distribution and we are in the process of evaluating those data. Now the results of the study one, which is our original study, this is what it looks like. So this is the, the correlation matrix. So you have always five variables down here and then again and again and again and you have here the physical variables and here the psychological variables and the false color coding gives you the significance level, which is out here, right? So this is the experimental matrix, and this is the control matrix. Right, so just switch back again. Experimental matrix, control matrix. I think you can see quite clearly that uh, the experimental matrix has many more significant correlations in it than the uh, control matrix. And if you do the standard analysis, you also see that there is uh, quite a difference. All right, so here you have the number of the experimental correlations. The expected correlation is the green one. And the control ones, they confirm comparatively well. And no matter what significant threshold you use, it looks the same. And if you do the standard analysis, what you see, you get about five sigma difference uh, between those correlation matrices. It, and it doesn't matter whether you use this or this or this significance level as a threshold, OK? Now, the Monte Carlo analysis using that formula gives a more conservative estimate um, which is, <clears throat> which you can see here. So this is the significant threshold up here. This is the standard set score. And this is the simulated one. This is the, the p-value, the simulated p-value. And you can see it's uh, significant up to this point. The yellow ones are all significant. The uh, red ones are not significant. And this down here is the forward looking correlation, a part of the correlation matrix. And depending on what type of correlation matrices you use, this is the full matrix, this is uh, only partial matrix which simulates previous experiments and this as well. You get different type of uh, significances, but actually it's more conservative, but it is still significant. Now, this is the uh, sens sensitivity analysis. The results are comparatively <coughs> stable. And they are also significant with the new analysis, but a little bit more conservative. Now, this is the replication, study two and number three by Anna. This is a summary result only using the uh, standard analysis of uh, the set score difference. Here is the P of the uh, 0 0.1 correlation, 0, 0 0.5 significance, and so forth. And this is the set score. Right? So she, get, she got very, uh, very big set scores. This is the first experiment, and this is the second experiment. These are comparatively large. And what you see here is uh, only partial matrix. That's the, uh, the upper diagonal that codes for the forward looking, so the, in the, the future correlations, which should be completely free of any causal correlations. 
And also here she gets comparatively strong indi indications for significant results. We do not have Monte Carlo simulated uh, statistical analysis for those data yet because that's still in the making. And this is the, what the second experiment looks like. The first I don't have. That's the second experiment. Experimental data, and this is the control data. Experimental data, control data. So it looks as if that uh, thing is actually replicable. I'm quite surprised myself. I'm not sure whether the um, Monte Carlo analysis will be stable, but I think it will because the set scores are comparatively high. So the summary is, I hope that we have found a robust uh, experimental paradigm where we get more significant correlations under the experimental condition compared to the control condition. We will have to use uh, more conservative analysis which we are still in the process of working out and there is a few other data by Hartmut Grote who is here and just published that and I want to point that out. There is a post hoc analysis for, and this is a Monte Carlo simulation, right? If, I'm, if I understand that correctly, what you have here is experimental and the control data. And you have some things sticking out here, which is quite interesting. And uh, the difference calculated post hoc is 0 0.01. And the interesting thing about that experiment, I find, is that he used different uh, psychological variables. So these are psychological variables of the participants uh, coming from scales, which we didn't use. And so there is an interesting uh, future, I'm finished. There is a, an interesting future uh, perspective of using different variables. So we are in the process of setting up a large consortium replication and whoever wants to join us is welcome to do that. We will have to find independent funding for that yet. <clears throat> And I think a pinch of skepticism is warranted. We don't know whether that really holds water because we need more replications on that. And it may be necessary to actually build some, some insecurity or some freedom of movement into the system in order to make it happen. But that might be possible. So, uh, funded by the BL Foundation, by the, by the way. And if you want more information, write me an email. Thank you for your attention. I think we are... A, a slight weakness I see in the arguments here, and this is partly because I have never believed von Lukadu's non-signaling theorem, is that the, uh, the, the experiment you have set up um, will produce results uh, whether there is conventionally interpreted psi that could be used for signaling, or if von Lukadu's uh, non-signaling psi is uh, available, uh, is the only form available. So the fact that you're getting positive results is quite encouraging, and we can hope that it will prove to be replicable, but at, at the moment it does not seem to make a very strong justification of the idea that a, a no signaling theorem applies to psi phenomena. Well, I'm, I must say I disagree completely uh, because of various reasons. I think we have enough data in the parapsychology database and we have enough data in various uh, complementary medicine databases to see that it's actually happening all the time, that if you replicate things, uh, they go away, they change channels, you see uh, Bill Bankson's mice, they do these, they have these strange uh, habit of shifting effects to the control group. That is a strong argument and I think if you look into the correlational data, what you would expect if psi were a signal, you would expect the certain cells to be always populated in the same way and that is exactly what you not see. You see the effect switching channels to different correlational patterns and that is exactly what that experiment was designed to capture. When, the, when those in the experimental group sat at the computer, what were they doing exactly? They were trying to influence uh, this fractal which you have to imagine as being dynamic. It comes out of, 
out of the thing and grows and it shrinks and it grows and it shrinks dependent on the sampling of the random process. And they got an instruction with that little thing here. Uh, if that was an arrow pointing right, the instruction was grow it. When the instruction was pointing left, the instruction was shrink it. And if it was like that, it was keep it stable. So it was an intentional instruction to act on the behavior of that fractal driven, driven by a random number process, which is in fact classically impossible. Maybe I missed it, but is there something special about the imagery that you were using? Was that, uh, or just this, anything? We, we were just using the original one which Walter used for his previous experiments. We were just using the very same display. And the fact that it was colorful and yeah. just well, made it I helpful. Well, I think the fact that it's colorful and it's playful is something that gets people involved. And the idea about the, the, mo the theoretical model is you have to close uh, the system somehow. And you do that by getting people involved in the experiment and by the experimental instructions. And that helps to get people involved because it looks nice. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again.